unmute. Right. Um, well, good afternoon, uh, and thank you for joining online. Uh, we've had a bit of a delay uh, here because of another meeting uh, running over, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, with our uh, guest speaker, Bill uh, Ferguson, and then uh, folks will hopefully trickle in uh, soon from, from the other meeting while we're, while we're going. Uh, but Bill has been a uh, regular visitor to uh, INET Oxford. I'm delighted to have him back again. Uh, he's a political scientist who uses game theory and other techniques to analyze problems of collective action and, and other issues. And he's gonna talk about uh, his uh, current work on uh, social division. So thanks very much, Bill. Uh, sorry about the uh, hiccups with the other meeting, but uh, look forward to hearing the lecture. And, and we are recording this, uh, so it'll also be available to everyone uh, online. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, absolutely, uh, appreciate uh, being back at INET Oxford. I appreciate being invited for this talk. So thank you very much. Um, okay, so the topic here then is uh, stratification economics and the political economy of social cleavages and ethnic racial identities, okay? And um, uh, I have to hit the keyboard. I guess I'll, I'll hit the button here, okay. It wasn't working earlier, okay. Okay, that's a first one. Sorry, let's just check one of things to work. Sorry. Maybe stop sharing. <laughs> It should be. Oh. Why did it stop working? I, oh, there we go. I don't know. Let me just screen oh, share sure, again. Yeah. Uh, screen share. Yeah. Slide share. Oops. Share. Okay. And let's try. No, why is this? Not operating like no. a slideshow. What's the deal? Oh, and we're back to touch anything. Hang on. Chaos. No, I think you're going to have to swipe. I'm you're sorry. You have to slide it that way. Yeah. Sorry. sorry. All right. Okay. So let's go. Uh, okay. So again, <laughs> title stratification economics and the political economy of social cleavages and ethnic racial identities. Uh, introduction here. So a couple of couple of incidents that illustrate what can happen here. Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the United States. Um, in 1920, the Greenwood District of Tulsa was called the Black Wall Street. It was a thriving business district with banks, insurance companies, and so on and so forth. And then on May 30th and 31st of 1921, there was an incident that changed everything. Uh, what happened was a, a, a black man and a white woman were in the same elevator going up the stairs in one of the buildings. And after that happened, she reported that he had done something inappropriate, which in these days in the segregated United States was probably pretty easy to do. Uh, rumors started flying around. Uh, the local press reported her side of the story, perhaps with exaggeration. And what happened was the police then apprehended the black man put him in a jail cell on the upstairs of the police station. And shortly thereafter, a white mob gathered outside demanding release of him so that they could you know, give him what they called justice, right? Uh, the, uh, the black community um, <clears throat> heard about this and a, a large group of black men also assembled in front of the police station and a melee ensued. And what happened was that the white mob then moved into the Greenwood district uh, and started destroying property, burning buildings and killing people. And this incident was called the Tulsa Massacre. Okay, so that's one incident. A second incident uh, occurred in the partition between India and Pakistan. And here's what economist Amartya Sen had to say about this. From my own childhood memory of the Hindu-Muslim alliance of the 1940s, linked with the politics of partition, I recollect the speed with which the broad human beings of January were suddenly transformed into the ruthless Hindus and fierce Muslims of July. Okay, so um, what I wanna argue here is that these kinds of social cleavages can rapidly emerge and that they are going to impede a whole series of developmental 
uh, processes. And this, this discussion will focus on race and ethnicity. Uh, others are possible. Uh, so there's gonna be a couple of questions. One, why is it that race and ethnicity uh, often generate greater social cleavages than other group distinctions such as social class? Two, why does the intensity of ethnic racial cleavage sometimes dramatically escalate in response to relatively small events? And three, for given identities within groups, how might the introduction of one or a few new players uh, who are relatively hostile rapidly generate into a opening of a social cleavage? Okay, so outline for the talk. I'll begin with three approaches to ethnicity and racial conflict. Uh, first two from political scientist Donald Horowitz emphasizes uh, innate uh, ethnic conflict. Uh, second political scientist Henry Hale emphasizes on uh, Ethnicity is a cognitive device. And the third approach from William Darity and a few other prominent uh, African American economists uh, on stratification economics puts an emphasis on explaining persistent inequality and conflict over resources. Okay. So then I want to go into some micro foundations, a little bit on boundary rationality and mental models, and then identity economics. And then finally, uh, notion of multiple identities related to race, ethnicity, social cleavage, uh, why race, ethnicity, rather than social class, uh, and this question of rapid emergence of conflict. Okay, so we'll begin with a couple of definitions of ethnicity. Uh, from Horowitz, uh, ethnicity is a subjective belief of common descent, okay? Doesn't have to be true, it's just a belief. Uh, it's a scriptive and difficult to change, and affiliation with an ethnic group implies becoming one with the group. Um, but the group boundaries themselves are quite mutable and depend a great deal on social context, prior developments, and so forth. Uh, Hale uh, takes uh, Max Weber's definition of ethnicity as a perception of common descent and culture, and at least some traits usually associated with these things, including language, physical resemblance. Uh, common ritual regulation of life, including religion. So now I'm going to focus on Horowitz briefly. Uh, Horowitz offers a theory of what he calls raw ethnic sentiment and conflict. Uh, so ethnic conflict emerges from struggle over group worth, a drive, and this emerges from a drive for positive social identity. And Horowitz considers this to be an innate human feature, right? Uh, uh, this drive for social identity via comparison and competition with other groups. And it's, of course, much more intense when the groups are located close to each other. Okay. Um, he argues that a key dimension of division here concerns the distinction between backward or traditional as opposed to advanced or modern, uh, within which backwardness implies some sort of weakness or lack of intellect. Uh, that generates a threat to the value of affiliating with the group that's labeled as backwards. Uh, and that can produce anxiety and defensiveness and hostility. Uh, but he argues that possession of land and recognition by the polity can temper this problem, right? Uh, can generate legitimacy that can offset the poor group evaluation that you might get over here, okay? Uh, and then this combination between the two groups can lead to political conflict. Okay. Um, Horowitz also argues about the deadly significance of symbols, uh, saying that symbolism is effective in ethnic conflict because it closes ethnic claims and ideas and associations that have acknowledged moral force beyond the particular conflict, okay, thereby masking something that would otherwise be controversial. Right? So symbols can hide the controversy. Uh, and then he's going to argue that the ambiguity plays an important role here. Symbolism permits the purposeful confusion of meaning as to conflate segmented claims with a wider political morality. Okay. Uh, and then we can understand conflict from a prism of class status claims related to these symbols, and we can get a notion of. of group entitlement from comparative work and legitimacy. And these notions can then explain why the masses may follow elites because the elites can manipulate these symbols. And second, 
the intensity of ethnic conflict. All right. Hale has a somewhat distinct but closely related approach with somewhat different emphasis. Uh, Hale wants to distinguish ethnicity from ethnic politics. Okay. Horowitz doesn't quite draw that distinction. Uh, and he takes what he calls a relational approach to ethnicity and considers ethnicity to be a cognitive device for reducing uncertainty. And it does so by locating oneself in the complex social world, all right? Uh, and then Hale's gonna argue that uncertainty reduction is really the primary human motive here that's driving all of this. And ethnicity turns out to be an extraordinarily convenient tool for reducing uncertainty. Uh, and therefore, ethnicity offers kind of a pre-rational foundation to a set of interactions and sentiments. Uh, he argues that ethnicity has thick or high information content uh, with, with important links to social causality. So it can be associated with a perceived common fate, similar to Horowitz, by the way, uh, correlates with other important factors, often with economic development, differential, differential development between groups, correlates with other social categories. It may correlate with class or occupation. Uh, and it tends to be strong when it's associated with a division of labor. Labor, one group does one type of work, another group does another type of work. Okay. Uh, other properties, easy to perceive and hard to change. Uh, imposed importance, uh, cites the example of race in the United States. Uh, often correlated with different normative values. In other words, Bupe has one set of values. Group B has a different set of values. Uh, these perceptions uh, and outcomes affect people's opportunities, uh, <clears throat> set limits, uh, and different values and different behavioral expectation between different groups generate distinct coordination equilibrium. Uh, and what Hale wants to argue is that other types of cleavage, uh, potential cleavages along social class, age, and so forth, simply do not possess this diversity, this range and depth of associations that ethnicity does, does confer. And for Hale, that's why ethnicity is so important. Uh, then moving on to ethnic politics, he's going to argue that politics is about interests. So in other words, you can use all the political economic models of interest to understand ethnic politics, but ethnicity is really the foundation of the conceptual foundation on which ethnic politics rests. Uh, so what are we doing here? We're maximizing wise chances with respect to wealth, power, security, and status. Um, and then ethnicity and conceptions are going to often accentuate a series of collective action problems that emerge in ethnic politics. Uh, and Hale stresses that solutions to ethnic conflict should not treat ethnicity itself as a motive, but rather need to address why people interpret specific situations in terms of ethnic divides. So again, on the interpretation of cognitive dimension of this. Okay. Third approach, stratification economics developed by uh, William Darity and several other economists. Um, Want to that their, their chief purpose is to explain the persistence of between group inequality uh, by race and ethnicity. And so that, that stratification economics can then give us the foundations of a theory of structural racism uh, and structural ethnic discrimination. Okay. So their premise is going to be that human satisfaction arises primarily from a relative position both within and between groups. Okay. Uh, and this can be associated with what we could call last place aversion. Nobody wants to be last. This will reinforce tendencies for dominant groups or individuals to strive to maintain their position uh, and can generate unfavorable identities for members of stigmatized groups. Uh, and the process of identity formation uh, depends on both self-classification and classification from society. So there's a mix here. And this all in relation to group affiliation. And then they're going to say that there's really four primary building blocks to stratification economics. The first is the notion of stereotype effects, which can be threat, lift, or boost effects. The threat effect, which I think is fairly commonly known, is members of a stigmatized group, when mixing with members of a dominant group, may feel uncomfortable, and this may reduce their performance 
on things like standardized tests. Okay, in other words, uh, in a different environment, they could do better uh, without this stereotype threat. Uh, a second one, and this is important and uh, sort of reflects the fact that these people are economists, real conflict theory. In other words, they're going to argue that competition over material resources and relative pos position with respect to that underlies group formation. So this is going to be a real foundation, this conflict theory on uh, group formation, group affiliation, and group identity. Uh, so there's a quotation, the group range, uh, the group ranging in scale from family to tribe to clan develops a sense of kinship, fictive or otherwise, driven by the extent to which it is in competition with other groups over relative status. So this competition uh, that is a driving force behind the conceptions of identity. And this is what distinguishes this approach somewhat from Hale. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And then they're going to argue as a third building block the notion of prejudice, but they want to define this as a group relationship, not an attribute of individual psychology, which they find less interesting. Okay. And so they're going to say there are often four types, and four types of often subtle shared group feelings. Okay. One would be a feeling of own group superiority. Another would be a feeling that the other group is somehow alien. The third, and very important to their argument, is the notion of a proprietary claim to exclusive rights. In the dominant group over property, jobs, occupation, decision making positions, and other uh, positions of social prestige. Okay. And then finally, fear and suspicion that the supportive group has designs on the dominant group's access and privilege. Okay. Uh, so we're going to end up with group comparisons. Group identities are going to influence propensities for collective action and coalition formation as they would entail. And comparison groups can be racial, ethnic, they can be based on gender, class, or religion. Uh, and within these comparisons, we can have dominant and subordinate groups. And both groups have their own internal hierarchies. And this is an important element of what they're talking about. And so that individuals are going to evaluate their own position both within their own group and between their group and others. And the relative importance of which matters for the comparison is going to depend very much on social context. In other words, the strength of these two types of comparisons is malleable uh, and depends on social context. And then comparisons are often going to concern relative economic position and political power. Okay. Uh, implications for provision of public goods. Well, uh, we're going to, they, they're going to say there's going to be a, a uh, type of within group altruism, in other words, willing to sacrifice for one's own group. Uh, and not for other groups, and that real conflict again can lead to a hostility or a rivalry. Okay, so that's the first step, the, these first three stories. Then I want to move a little bit to micro foundations of social cleavage. Okay, all three of these theories have roots in identity and cognitive processes, just slightly different emphases. And then I want to say a little bit of how identity theory of origin with its origins and founded rationality. And the concept of mental models. Okay. So, bounded rationality, which I expect is relatively familiar to this audience, right? Uh, so, I want to spend time on it. It goes beyond imperfect uh, asymmetric information uh, to real uncertainty and adds, importantly, the notion that human cognition is, in fact, limited. Even if we had all the information, we wouldn't be smart enough to figure out certain things. Okay. Uh, cognition, moreover, is costly. Uh, therefore, people engage in trial and error learning. Uh, they're going to be goal oriented, um, but they're going to respond to context with these cognitive limits. Uh, means preferences can be evolving in response to context. Uh, Heiner uh, defines what we could call a CV competence difficulty gap, which is the gap between an agent's competence and the difficulty of the decision or problem to be solved, which we could argue is very small in the instance of, say, choosing whether to buy apples or oranges in the store, and perhaps quite large with respect to complicated decisions such as how to finance a home purchase or how to uh, orchestrate a political strategy. Um, okay, uh, we can go to Kahneman's uh, sort of relating to behavioral economics and psychology, Kahneman's cognitive systems, which are well known, I believe, that's one thinking fast, intuitive, Needs your heuristics, attributes, subjugation, and so forth. 
uh, S2, slow thinking, deliberate, reflective, effortful. And this has a high cognitive cost. If you think of trying to solve differential equations in your head, something like that. Right? Um, and then we can have a spectrum between these two. Uh, and then what I want to move to is the notion of mental models. Okay? So one could argue that this is how bounded rational, rational agents essentially navigate uncertainty. Uh, mental model then is a conceptual representation or framework that includes categories, social categories, old, young, so forth, physical categories, perhaps, uh, along with cause and effect relationships uh, and uh, certain specific patterns. We could say that uh, everybody in a university setting has a mental model of classroom categories, professors, students, cause and relationships, professor gives assignments, students do work, so on and so forth, right? Uh, and these are going to emerge from prior experience learning with intuitive, inductive, and deductive reasons. So sort of these mental models are going to combine all of these cognitive sources, uh, combine S1 and S2 to make judgments. Um, and these are going to give us perceptions that respond very much to context and framing, framing rather. Uh, two types of learning. Uh, one would be hypothesis testing within, within a given mental model. Uh, relatively costless thought experiments. Uh, information can confirm or refute specific hypotheses. Okay, uh, or reevaluative learning, which means go back to the drawing board, uh, reconfigure your entire way of thinking about the problem, and this will tend to emerge only after a series of failures with the original mental model. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so we need substantial salient problems or inconsistencies to engage in reevaluative learning. Uh, what are the implications? Uh, mental models can generate systematic bias. Uh, they're gonna follow a punctuated equilibrium dynamic whereby a reigning mental model will exist for a long time just with hypothesis testing, but sufficient inconsistency will occasionally generate a sort of disruptive, rapid disruptive change where people may have abandoned the model. And important, very important for this discussion, Mental models are shared and they're shared via narratives. Okay, so that leads us to shared mental models, uh, common vocabulary category, perceived patterns, expectation, prior effect relationships, transmitted culturally. This reduces cognitive costs, much easier to learn something that other people have thought about than to go through the whole process oneself. And they can uh, help remedy free cognitive free rider problems. Uh, here, important for this discussion, it generates a role for leadership. Uh, and it generates a role for what we could call normative and political entrepreneurship. Individuals who are going to invest resources in trying to change other people's mental models with respect to things like appropriate behavior. Okay. Uh, and then the manipulation of mental models is a fundamental way of exercising power. Uh, and this has multiple implications for political economy and also for our topic today of social cleavages. Uh, and we, are, they, we can think of two key types, ideologies and institutions. I'm not going to say much about our institutions at all today. That's a separate lecture. Okay. Uh, they have an evolutionary logic. I don't think I want to spend time on this equation, but if somebody wants to look at it. But it really has to do with a sort of a notion of relative success of one type of model or heuristic uh, compared to another one, where depending on probabilities of success, but these probabilities aren't known. They're just inferred from adaptive learning. And I think I'll leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> so this again gives us a punctuated equilibrium dynamic to shared mental models, long periods of stability, short periods of disruption. And during punctuation, then we have a breakdown of the sort of uh, collective action choreography that shared mental models can give us. Uh, so they're going to fall, they're going to fall apart, social coordination may fall apart. Um, and the breakdown can have roots in either exogenous shocks or a slow buildup of certain types of relations past the critical mass relationship. And I'll give an example of that later. Uh, increase CD gap, fundamental uncertainty, small events can generate cascades. Leave it at that. Okay, so that was the first set of concepts. Identity then, which is fundamental to what we're talking about here. We can think of a uh, person's concept of self in relation to others, okay? And it's a type of mental model. Uh, <clears throat> and so it includes categories of, and causality. Uh, who am I? What type of person am I? What is expected of me? Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> it's fundamentally social response to others influence one's own self image. Uh, and so it's partially chosen and partially conditioned for socially imposed. Okay. So an example I give is uh, part of my identity, I guess, would be as a professor, partially chosen, I went to graduate school after all, but the definition of the professor and the expectations of the professor, I didn't create any of those. Those came from society. Okay. Uh, three and four are important here. People prefer activity that affirms their perceptions of who they are. Okay, and then we can get negative identity externalities, whereby one's actions influence another person's utility gained from their identity. And a classic example of this would be a woman starts working on a male, primarily male construction site. Some of the men may feel threatened by this, or at least somewhat uncomfortable by her presence, and that would be an example of an identity externality. So we can come up with a model of identity, not the law of Cranton. Utility depends on actions which depend on material payoffs and identity payoffs, uh, actions of self, actions of others, and then also just on one's own identity. And then identity depends on the actions, again, characteristics such as height, uh, social categories, uh, and then norms associated with those social categories, okay? Um, these equations we could think of in terms of sort of standard game theoretic substantive rationality, but the identity concepts themselves and the heuristics and proclivities associated with them are going to all come from boundedly rational learning processes and evolutionary processes. Okay. So now moving to identity and social cleavages or returning to that, the three approaches I mentioned, right? Horowitz, Hale, and Darity. Um, <clears throat> Are going to link ethnic, racial, social cleavages uh, to cognitive processes closely related to identity. All three approaches have that. Uh, this notion fits uncertainty reduction. It can be ascriptive, it can be related to perceived heritage, and so forth. It can be a focus of both within and between group comparison, and it can resolve or generate collective action problems in related conflict. Okay. Uh, so here, Amartya Sen's notion of plural and singular identities is quite important, okay? So Sen argues that identity concepts evolve, they're not static, they evolve, and that individuals possess multiple identities. So the identity equation above is really a vector, it's not a single variable. Uh, these identities can refer to religion, political ideology, ethnic group, race, occupation, marital status, age, age rather, position in family, uh, group activities such as sports, sports clubs, and so forth. Okay. Uh, then Sen's going to argue that violence tends to focus identity on singular identities. Okay. And so this is going to argue this is what happened during the partition, right? Um, and when that happens, uh, individuals experience what we could call excessive identity demands. In order to be a person in this group, here's a whole set of things that you must do. Okay. Uh, and people end up with a perceived absence of choice about identities and the illusion of a singular identity that others must attribute to a person to be demeaned. So in other words, during the petitions, um, uh, some would argue that Hindus basically said, all Muslims are gonna be like this. And Muslims are gonna say the same thing about Hindus, completely ignoring individual attributes of all of, all of the people involved. Okay. Uh, and so this can bring us to the question, well, how might we relate, model the relationship between identities and social cleavage? Uh, so we can talk about an aggregate identity function. Uh, here's the individual identity function. We can say for individuals, the identity vector then is going to be a weighted average of E, which is their ethnic racial identity, and Z, which is everything else. Okay. Um, <clears throat> For groups, same thing, group identity, a weighted average of E and Z, uh, where the capital sigma sum, sums the lambdas in some fashion amongst the individuals. Uh, and the group can equal D or O, D for dominant, O for other. Uh, and then we can generate a simple model of social cleavage reflecting uncertainty and interest. So we can say that omega here is the probability of serious social cleavage 
current of violence and so forth. And we can say that that's going to depend really following what Sen says on the size of this parameter that gives us the weight to the ethnic racial identity. And that we're going to argue that it does so with increasing returns. Okay. Uh, whoops. Uh oh. Oh, yeah. the, just tap the slide you want. Yeah. You scroll back up to where you were. Three questions. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. Complicated screen here. All right, uh, so, so anyway, um, again, increasing returns to this weight on ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic racial identity uh, as it approaches a singular identity for sin, we're more likely to get conflict with others. Okay, so we get this, this can give us some insight into three questions. In a multiple identity model, what could rapidly increase the salience of the racial identities? Uh, how does the contrast between a high and low value for the sigma term influence group interactions? And three, for given identities, how can social cleavage emerge from a small change in group composition? Okay. So question one, why the rapid increase? Uh, so we can say, there we go. Uh, social political influences on the lambda and sigma parameters here. And then we can say, okay, we've got two groups. Again, B is the dominant. O is the other or the oppressed group. And we can say that the strength of this relationship depends on the following. A, a relative income and wealth, okay, uh, reflecting resource conflict, relative education levels between the two groups, relative position of land between the two groups, the extent of visibility of the quote, other characteristic. And this really has to do with the symbols and the symbolic relationship between the two groups. Okay, and then what we can say here is that this fits all three of our theories in some some degrees. In other words, these two terms, wealth uh, and education, affect relate to Horowitz's notion of the backward modern distinction. Uh, these two plus land relate to Darity's influence of resource conflict on identity. This is going to influence the salience of different types of identity. Uh, the land relationship uh, relates to Horowitz's notion of land as a source of ethnic legitimacy that could counteract other unfavorable comparisons. Uh, and then the SRD status, political significance of symbols. Uh, and then the, the V term Horowitz and Hale on the vis visibility and Darity on what he calls colorism, which is pretty obvious what that means. Uh, and then essentially related to all between group comparison, last place aversion, uh, prejudice, uh, stress, of, stress by Darity, but related to the other two, uh, D group superiority, proprietary claim, A is alien, suspicion, and so forth. In other words, these terms can relate to everything we just talked about in the three theories. Okay, <clears throat> so that's question one. Question two, interactions and critical mass. Suppose groups D and O coexist in close proximity and in a relatively peaceful fashion, okay? So we can say that in these equations, the sigma term uh, equals 0.75 is a tipping point. It's critical mass tipping point, below which there's relative peace, low probability conflict, and above which there's social conflict that probably increases with increasing hostility as you get above that threshold. Um, and then we can say, well, what determines that? Well, we can just go back to these arguments here. The uh, material comparisons here, the educational comparison, and so on and so forth, are really going to influence whether these sigmas stay below or move above that 0.75. So we can get a theory here of social origins of ethnic conflict. Uh, obviously, we can develop this in more detail, uh, and we can get a series of testable hypotheses that can follow propositions one through seven from the prior slide, which I think is going to be yeah, it's too difficult to get back to that. Um, <clears throat> then we can also represent this by a simple sequential game where we've got an identity norm. Let's say the dominant group has an identity norm that they actually expect everyone in the society to follow, okay? Um, <clears throat> the other group can decide whether to follow or not. 
the dominant group can decide whether to punish or not. And we've got a series of payoffs here, uh, where P is the amount of punishment for not following, probably doesn't happen here because there's a cost to punishing. So we're probably not going to do that. So if they follow, we're probably going to end up here. Um, on the other hand, if they don't follow, what happens is that the, the other group gets a utility gain from doing what it wants, but has to pay the cost of being punished. And the dominant group uh, gets a lower payoff uh, compared to following, but they're gaining an identity utility from punishing the other group and effectively getting revenge. Uh, minus the cost of administering punishment uh, per unit cost of punishment twice an hour. And then uh, if they're not punished, we get these utilities. So, so, that, so that's the, and so what, what happens here is that we can argue that the sigma from the prior argument, if it's above 75, the um, value of the utility value of punishing the other group exceeds the cost of punishment, and they'll go ahead and punish. But if it's below 0.75, they don't. So below 0.75 in this model, um, the groups can more or less live with each other without punishment. Above 0.75, the punishment is going to occur. Okay. Then question three, group composition. Uh, individuals and in group, both groups are going to have fixed identities. So the lambdas will be fixed. There's, but there's going to be heterogeneity across these lambdas with each group in which case they're going to range between zero and one. So the importance of the racial ethnic identity can be very low or very high, okay? Uh, the ind individual propensity to fight is going to depend on this size of this parameter. And where we can say is P or rho F is a uh, probability of fight depends on the parameter times that lambda. Uh, mathematically, we can make that parameter two, just make it linear for simplicity. Uh, and what's going to happen then is that in this model is that individuals are going to suffer an identity utility cost if they cooperate with members of the other group. And the cost of that is going to depend very much on the size of this lambda identity, uh, the, the, the importance of the racial ethnic identity uh, to the group. Okay. Uh, and so we can get a game here. This comes from Kaushik Basu actually, where the two players can cooperate, say on a provision of some public good or they can fight, okay? And we're gonna argue then that uh, there's a visible skin phenotype that distinguishes whether the member is B or O. Um, and there's an invisible psychic cost to cooperation, okay? Uh, where the cost of cooperation can range between zero and two, really depending on the lambda parameter, right? Uh, and we're gonna argue that this X term here is some number less than 10, so that if C equals zero, this is a game of assurance, they should be able to form a focal point on cooperate, cooperate. Um, and we could argue that within group, this C is gonna be equal zero, so within group, they'll cooperate, okay? Between group, we could say, well, this depends, right? We could have a C equals zero, so no problem, cooperate. Or for that matter, any value less than one, an individual will still prefer cooperating with the other group. But for any value greater than one, they're always going to prefer fault. Okay. So we got, we can say, uh, and we can use this game to argue why it would be rational for all members of a group to fight, even when the majority as individuals would prefer to cooperate. Okay. And so this is this is. This is the interesting notion that relates to a tipping point, okay? So suppose there's three possible types within each group. Type one, no cost of cooperation with anybody. Type two, uh, 0.5 cost of cooperating with the other group, okay? They'll still cooperate though. Type three, C greater than one, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Initially, suppose there are four players, two type ones and two type twos in each group. So each group has four players, okay? Uh, so we can still get an assurance game with a CC equilibrium. No big deal. Um, now let's allow two type threes to enter into each group. Okay. What's going to happen then is when, when um, and we don't know who's what, right? So the type twos will, can all look at the relative probabilities of encountering a type three from the other group and decide that they're better off fighting. Okay. With these payoffs, that can be shown. But if the type twos want to fight, and the type ones can infer that through backward induction, the type ones are also going to want to fight. 
So in other words, we're going to end up with everybody fighting, even though four out of the six would prefer not to, if it were just an individual decision. <clears throat> okay. And then we can make a much stronger statement by saying there are n players with a uniform distribution of the c's between zero and one. Actually, initially less than one. Uh, constant discrete differences between every person. Okay. And then introduce two players with uh, with c greater than one plus q. Then you can get a cascading effect where player n minus one decides to fight. Player n minus two, understanding that, would also want to fight. Player n minus three, understanding that, would also want to fight all the way down. So again, you can get here, you get a tiny minority comes in, uh, and everybody's going to end up wanting to fight. Right? And then this, this idea could then relate to political entrepreneurship. A political entrepreneur can maybe just shift the propensity of a few members towards wanting to fight, and then we can get a cascade towards hostility. Okay. So model two, group altruism. Uh, groups with greater public goods are going to prosper more. Uh, here in this game, we can say that alpha is the utility gain from increasing another's payoff for whatever reason. Maybe, maybe they like them because they're a member of the group. Maybe they're just a naturally cooperative person. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, and we can say that when this alpha is less than 0.33, we're going to have a prisoner's dilemma game with a defect defect outcome. Uh, when it's greater than 0.06, we're going to end up with a Nash equilibrium that always cooperate. And in between, it's going to depend a little bit on what's going on. So assume that alpha equals 0.5, we can have a game of assurance with those payoffs. Um, and then we can draw several conclusions, two that I'll highlight. One is suppose we have segregation and group doubt, in other words, this stereotype threat effect operating among the O group. Okay. In that case, we might expect the alpha for the dominant group to be greater than one third, but the alpha for the stigmatized group to be less than one third. And if that's the case, the dominant group will provide more public goods for itself, in other words, club goods, than the oppressed group would. Uh, and we could see differential development paths, okay, where the dominant group is going to be able to develop more rapidly. This may be sort of the situation in Tulsa before the violence, but we did see that the Black Wall Street nonetheless did emerge until the incident. The second way would be to think of an elite society where the dominant group only gain utility from helping their own members, but the other group is going to gain utility from helping everybody own members for the same reason and maybe helping others because they're naturally so inclined or maybe because they aspire to be part of the dominant group for whatever reason. If that's the case, then we can go through, say, the probability of meeting, what's this one? The probability of meeting a dominant group member less than two thirds, then the, D, the dominant group expected payoff to cooperation is going to be this. And for the other group, their expected payoff to cooperation is going to be lower. Uh, well, if that's the case, then once again, the dominant group will get more public goods, therefore more development. Okay, so implications, model one, conflict game, rapid rise to hostility, tipping points related to the salience of ethnic racial identities, which can again go back to our equations of the relative income, relative education, relative land, and so on and so forth. And in addition to that, small changes uh, in the group can generate conflict. And again, that can give us a role for political and normative entrepreneurs to exacerbate that conflict. We could argue that something like that may currently be going on in the United States, for example, uh, perhaps particularly with respect to ideology. Okay, uh, model two, group altruism, uh, unequal provision of public goods, which often end up being club, club goods for the privileged group, uh, unequal micro, meso, and macro level development of prospects, okay. small groups, regions, nations, and so forth. Um, we have time. Do we still have time? Uh, have 10 minutes left. Okay. Well, there's a succession game here. Uh, we can see a region can decide to secede or not. A center can decide war, acquiesce, exploit, or cooperate. We can compare these payoffs, and we can argue that these payoffs are all going to depend on identity factors and the kinds of relationships we saw before. 
And we can essentially use this model to explain when a region of the country uh, might end up in seceding or not, and whether that secession will generate war or not. And I think I'll just leave it at that. This is a model that's in uh, uh, Hale. <clears throat> okay, so conclusions. Ethnicity and race are cognitive devices for reducing uncertainty with uh, uh, that has greater power than other types of classification. Um, ethnic politics emerges from malleable perceptions regarding interests and group status. So this is fairly close to what Hal says. In other words, Hal rather says. Uh, perception of group identity are going to underlie persistent inequities in structural ethnic discrimination and structural racism. And those identity perceptions are going to be influenced by resource conflict. So I'm going to take that from Darren at all. Okay. Um, malleable identity concepts can generate a rapid escalation of conflict that we saw at the end of the presentation in normative political uh, <clears throat> normative and political entrepreneurs can foster conflict. Okay. Conclusion set two, social cleavages arise from micro level cognition uh, and interactions. Uh, identity concepts sh as shared mental models are transmitted by narratives, they can respond to the real conflict variables uh, and as well as to symbols, okay? Uh, group competition, small changes can escalate conflict and different inclination toward within group altruism can generate inequities of opportunity, outcomes and development. Uh, that again. Mm -hmm. So just a, yeah, just a double tap on it. Okay. Okay, that's where I was, right? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, third set of conclusions. Uh, so we can go back to our original three questions. In other words, this set of models can explain why ethnicity and race are often more potent than social class as drivers of social cleavage, uh, rapid exacerbation of social cleavages, and a bad apple hypothesis, why the introduction of a few new players can generate conflict or why the shift in perception of new players can generate conflict. So that's it. Thanks. Excellent. Oops, no. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. One more thing. Uh, point to development of collective action problems, potential role for political entrepreneurs, or accept that, lingering hostility, structural ethnic exclusion, and unequal development. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, that was, that was uh, uh, fascinating and, and um, I think very, you know, very relevant to some work that uh, we were interested in, in, in doing here. And so we should follow up and talk about how we might uh, bring some of that together. Um, okay. Just a couple of uh, sort of specific comments and questions. Uh, um, first, just another kind of perspective on these issues that, that you might integrate in. I think it's very consistent with, with you know, the way you pulled this together from these different, different perspectives is the uh, multi-level selection perspective from evolutionary biology mm -hmm. and uh, David Sloan Wilson and Eleanor Ostrom uh, wrote some nice pieces yeah. on that and, and the yeah. idea of you know how you you know to create cooperation you need in in, in groups and and you know, the creation of identities uh, to reduce the cognitive load and cooperation just as you describe and then mm -hmm. you know and how that leads to um, uh, you know uh, evolutionary competition among, among groups and so on. But anyway, mm -hmm. it just might be worth looking at that literature because I think that would also fit in well. Oh, work. absolutely. Yeah, um, I draw heavily on the Yeah, yeah. And, anyway. and their work, you know, David Stone Wilson is an evolutionary biologist. They had a nice, yeah. co a nice yeah. collaboration, right. uh, right. multi-level selection uh, right. to social right. theories of cooperation. Yeah. yeah. Um, the uh, a question is, how um so you're probably familiar with you know Bowles and Ginsis's work on um altruistic punishment mm -hmm, yeah and so in in your the kind of you know you you talk about a um you know a kind of the rational behavior model but my, my understanding of then when you kind of get into the game theory it's essentially a, a kind of you know maximizing model with those you know those weights and the function that you you know, and, and right. kind of the agents are doing kind of a cost benefit right, uh, right, uh, right. analysis. Um, as an extension to that, I wonder whether, you know, because uh, what Bowles and, and Gittes and, and others have you know, found is, is that when um, reciprocity is violated in, in cooperation or there's a perception of it that we will altruistically punish. 
right and um so that you don't even have to get over that kind of rational threshold to trigger that rational kind of cost benefit to trigger the the punishing or you know conflict so my hypothesis if, if that was integrated in that would actually make things even less stable um and, and escalate faster and and specifically you know i i because i've been doing some work on this myself um, one interpretation of, of what's happening in the politics in the U.S. Mm -hmm. is that um, at the heart of it are these notions of kind of contract violations and free riding that have been ethnicized. Mm -hmm. So think of Ronald Reagan's welfare queen. Sure, you know yeah. she's a free rider, right? Right, right. You know, yeah. and and that's and then you know a, a heavy kind of identity racist, you know. Uh, uh, attachment uh, yeah, uh, to absolutely. That. Yeah. the you know Trump's uh, narratives on immigration right. are you know you've been screwed you know yeah. they're free riders right. I'm going to fix the screwing absolutely and you know you can only trust cooperation within your group and 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 it's interesting you know and, and when you're talking about the provision of public goods we've had this degeneration of trust in public goods at the kind of national governmental level right. because of these narratives of, of free riding and abuse. But then actually very high social capital within. So if you look at you know studies of like church group, you know, right. ethnically based church groups in mm -hmm. the US South, yeah, yeah, you know, very high trust in social capital and public good provision. Right. And, and, and within like, those groups, yeah. Within those yeah, groups. Yeah. Within group um, yeah. But anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm rattling on a bit, but but I I, I think to me that this notion of of uh, altruistic punishment of you know actually you know the the, the People go crazy in essence in, in uh, when they feel these um, contract violations. That right. The amygdala, right. amygdala is light up and we yeah. do any stuff. That you know, integrating that in somehow would, you know. Well, actually, it's already there. Okay. So let me. Yeah. Hopefully, I'll scroll this the right way. Yeah. I go backwards, right? So in other words, I didn't. Uh, the altruistic punishment has everything to do mm -hmm. with this concept of within group altruism. Yeah. In other yeah. words, that, that's one of the ways it gets established. Yeah. So in other words, the, the group D and yeah. the group O may be fairly coherent within themselves. Yeah. And reciprocity relationships, which could yeah. underlie that. I didn't have yeah. time to explain that. Yeah. Sure. But altruistic punishment can can have a great deal to do with that. So if we go, if we go back to this game here, well, this one here mm -hmm. in other words this term here mm -hmm. is the satisfaction that d group d gets for punishing um <clears throat> the o who has violated right. their social okay. norm yeah. in other words from the perspective of group d that yeah. is altruistic punishment i see okay. in other words it's, it's a reciprocal you should have followed our norm right we follow our yeah, right. You don't. You therefore, I'm going to punish, punish you. So these but terms even here, even to my individual detriment. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So in other words, these two two, two terms here mm -hmm. are social preferences. They're not material preferences. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and they can both be very much related to reciprocity relationships. Okay. 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 So we could, in fact, what we could do is we could take a reciprocity model right. and use them to say, well, that's actually kind of where these things come from. Take right. a reciprocity model, mix it in with the identity model. And say, okay, this is where these and those social preferences from. could be weighted more highly than the material preferences. That's right. They can be higher or lower than yep. the material preferences. Yep. In fact, if we go um, back to mm -hmm. our um, really back to Akerlof and, mm -hmm. and Cranton's identity equation, yeah. we got that there. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. With, with the pi, with right. the pi terms as the material preference and the i terms as the identity. Yeah, influences on uh, values or utilities. Yeah, because that would seem to be a key source of instability in the system. Then you know, absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You're going to twist those, yeah. and those terms are really. That's why the so so the identity payoffs are going to reflect these yeah. these social preferences, and then in the model yeah. they depend on those ratios: the y y over over y d, yeah. education o over education d, land, etc. Uh, and also the symbols, and those things can then tip yeah. to give us this this sigma star cross that critical right. mass the, the tipping threshold. point, yeah. cross that threshold, and give us this high conflict. Right. And if you're a you know political entrepreneur who you know keeps pushing those buttons, you, exactly. can, you can drive the system into a pretty unstable yeah. state. Yeah. Uh, exactly. You know. Exactly. 
And let me mention that this that some of the concepts you just mentioned about the United States and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, I will discuss in the talk that I'm giving okay, at the right. Botanic School yeah. Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> so, fantastic. So that talk's going to focus on polarization within the United States. All right. Uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna advertise the talk to my students because I think they'll be very very interested in. Um, excellent. Well, we should uh, wrap up. I, I I haven't seen any questions popping up on online, but uh, yeah, okay. I, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn off the recording. Okay, great. And um, then if I can actually figure out how to. No longer screen share. I don't know whether we recorded or not. Maybe something down there. You can stop video. I don't know whether you can do that by recording the camera either. I'm not sure why that would be for all that. Oh, right. Maybe nice. Oh, but that's not that. coming in. It's on that screen and not this screen. Uh, some other Actually, uh, Susan's not here. Uh, wait a second. Mm -hmm. I'm a little surprised that they should catch you. Yeah. When you're in Zoom, there's no way to get a menu at the bottom. That's of what it. I thought. Yeah. I can get out of that. Nothing else. Test me, Ted. Well, it's not touch sensitive, so that's not working. <laughs> okay. Um, Yeah, we're still on. Yeah. Got rid of the slides, but we're still on. And you could switch users on the machine or something. I'm going to try to uh, get to that other screen. What's the other screen? So now it's going to be. Oh, wait, here we go. Now I've got it. Ah, there you go. Stop recording.